standing by outside the RBA headquarters with Mark Bailey of Fig Securities, of course, as he always is on RBA Day. Carson. It is great to be here. We are on the ropes almost, literally. We're kind of pens in. There's a lot of activity. Mark Bailey from Fig. We got construction going on uh, right opposite the reserve bank. Is that a metaphor for the animal spirits having been unleashed and actually them not needing to cut today? What's your view there? I don't think so. And I think if you're actually reading the figures behind the anecdotal evidence that you do see across the road, you know, th that sector is slowing down a bit. Um, and, you know, the RBA has also highlighted the fact in terms of house prices and the, and the kind of glut coming on the market mm. to be kind of wary on that in terms of investors. If you're looking more broadly in terms of some of the CPI figures that came out, we were obviously debating mm. beforehand. You know, I actually thought they were actually slightly stronger than expected, you know, 0.5 versus 0.4. I do take on board in terms of your year on year figures, which are well below the 2 to 3% band. But again, you know, that 2 to 3% band was set a long time ago for a different global economy. Mm. So my view is I think they'll probably hold today. It's going to be a line ball call. You know, markets are pricing in two thirds percent chance and, and around about 75% of economists are expecting a cut. So kind of against the consensus there. The Australian dollar, I mean, they don't mention it. No central bank will admit to a currency war. I mean, because frankly speaking, you can't fight the Fed. We know that. But once you start it, uh, all bets would be off. Uh, it would be that race uh, unbridled to zero. What of the push back to 80 cents, a live reality if they don't cut today? That would be higher than when they did cut in May at 77. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, but a lot of what is driving that Aussie dollar is the Fed and the fact that they are pushing out their interest rates uh, hike further further down the, 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 the chute, so to speak. And in terms of, you know, the, the Aussie dollar and what we're seeing there, I think, you know, in terms of... Um, so why fight the Fed, incidentally? Why fight them? I mean, if they are pushing it out even to next year, HSBC says middle 2017 is when we get the next rate hike by the Fed. If that's the case, why would you wait and do nothing and allow further uh, deflationary pressures into the economy? Look, I don't, I don't think that any central bank these days, given what happened to the Bank of England uh, you know, back in the early 90s, would actually look to take on the currency market and speculators there. I think it's a fool's game. You know, the currency will eventually go down to fundamentals and, and that in terms of GDP growth at around about two and a half, two point three percent is not bad considering what, what it is elsewhere. Mm. And you know the, the interest rate differential between the two countries is is also helping to drive the Aussie dollar. Back to your last point though, which was the concession on year on year one percent inflation. They can pass a quarter off as being a blip in the system, as being uh, factors beyond their control. But annualized it's a lot smoother. It's a lot more projecting uh, what has happened and what will likely then continue as the trend. They need to act, I put to you. It is, but again, if you look at the dual mandate of employment, the employment figures were pretty strong outside the headline figure. You know, part-time... Only, only keeping pace with immigration, as you know. The number of jobs out there in the real economy is barely meeting the number of uh, the, the demand that's there. So we're, we're basically not going back to 5%, which is universally regarded as full employment for Australia. We're above that level. That means there's more accommodation able to be used. That, that is true, but in terms of the going back to the jobs figures and the data that we've been provided, the full-time job count was plus 38,000, part-time was down 30,000. That 000. was only one month, though. That was one month. Not a trend. <laughs> it's not a trend. <laughs> but again, you know, but if you look at over that longer period of time, it, at, it has actually been quite strong on the employment side. So, I, again, I think the RBA, RBA has got room to consider its position. Hours work to falling. That is not good. That shows that there is still spare capacity in the economy and that in order to tap that, you need to create conditions for business that basically free them up to do just that. Their real prices are going up, Mark, as those rates uh, stay steady, but their costs stay fixed, which are their overheads, their rents. They're not, they're not falling. No, I, and it's, but, it, but equally, again, what, what has, has changed over the last month? Maybe the CPI? And as, I, as we kind of go back to, you know, we're kind of debating whether it was a, a, a weaker than expected figure or a stronger than expected figure, but was it so far out of the RBA's consensus and their expectations that it does force them to cut? And I also wonder as well whether Philip Lowe coming in in, in mid-September kind of throws a bit of an internal spanner in the works there in terms of what their um, yeah, position to do in terms of whether they want to leave some more ammunition in the kitty for, um, for the new governor. Or would you not argue, as Paul Fox from HSBC does, that it would be far better for uh, you know, the work to be done for Philip Lowe rather than creating a pressure on him for in his first outing to do something that arguably could be done sooner? rather than left till later. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can, you can 
yeah. you know, call both sides of the of the argument there. But uh, you know, it's just going to be interesting in terms of whether that does does um, you know, come internally. I'm obviously not going to see that in terms of the papers, but uh, I think the uh, you know, in terms of the Brexit situation as well, that's considerably better than it was last month. Uh, China, China, uh, looking looking relatively, you know, in terms of its. You know, it's demand for our products. Look at the iron ore price, for instance. I mean, it, it's defying all the naysayers and continuing to hold at elevated levels that many are expecting to unwind, but they haven't. Yeah, I mean, China's probably been mixed, you know, because it continues to plot along, you know, which has some pretty good PMI uh, data. Um, and the real and the real uh, metric sort of recognition of that coming from BHP and its production numbers, we'll get Rio's ones tomorrow. When you look at what they see as the real demand for what they ship, uh, versus the kind of flim-flam numbers China itself puts out, uh, miraculously on projection, even though most economists are now not covering those numbers. If you notice, the Bloomberg surveys have been winnowed down and winnowed down because fewer investment banks are prepared to actually nail their colours to the mast. They don't see those numbers as robust, do they? No, and I mean, I guess, you know, we've had our own question marks about our employment data as well through the ABS as well. I mean, obviously not to the same extent. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the real figures, BHP and Rio, um, you get you get a better read probably in terms of the internal workings of the Chinese economy there, and they're expected to be pretty robust as well. So again, you know, does that point to an RBA that needs to cut is, is going to be forced to cut? I'm not sure. I mean, I think the market pricing at around about two thirds of percent chance is is probably about fair. The idea as well of that type of thing that we began this discussion with, whether they're even converting those to flats is going to be interesting. That used to be a Westpac bank right opposite us. The, the idea, though, that we may, we may have seen the peak and, and arguably need to see the peak in construction uh, to now match some kind of an equilibrium on price, because like a lot of things, like that, that uh, demand supply on, on iron ore and, and energy and oil, even with building, if you get that runaway, uh, unbridled building story, it could be an overheated market, yet again, that we worry about. Do you get a sense that that is another consideration or the lending figures that we saw uh, out in June from the Reserve Bank suggest any a moderation care of APRA is doing it, that work anyway. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's the RBA's view as well, that the, you know, the, the legislation that's coming and the restrictions on lending have calmed the market down. But again, they, they were pretty explicit in, in terms of the, the minutes of the last meeting that there's a excess supply coming on the eastern seaboard capitals of, of Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne. Uh, and that's especially in the, on the apartment side, and that could potentially you know, cause a fairly severe pullback in terms of prices. So they're already flagging that as a, as a risk. Uh, and, and you know, I guess if, that's, if they're really worried about that, then potentially p just point to a, an, another cut. Really final thought, because we've got to wrap. The idea now that in this investment environment, you've got certain houses buying JGBs for capital gains. Uh, did that ever occur to you would be possible that would be a, an investment thesis? Uh, that in this case QIC adopts. Yeah, the greater fool theory. Um, no, no, 10 years ago, nobody would have thought negative yields, you know, the Swiss curve all the way out to 50 years negative yields. I mean, just it's a crazy, unprecedented time that we that we live in. Uh, and, you know, the central banks have to adopt to that. And uh, in terms of, you know, their, their inflation target of 2 to 3 percent, maybe that should be 1 to 2, and maybe the, that should be acknowledged more explicitly. Well, the governor saying he's not wanting to move on that targeting. He sees that it's worked and it was a New Zealand uh, concept, of course, and construct many years ago. Doesn't want to un unsettle the, the horses with the change there. But, Mark, thank you so much. Thanks, Unch, according to Mark Bailey, will be put out of our misery in how many minutes, Mark? My watch has stopped. Uh, in about 20. <laughs> okay. I think it's more like 20 now. We've, we've added on a little bit. But thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. We'll be back live with Warren. Hogan, uh, the economist par excellence in grid, and there's a cast full of characters in your studio all locked in, ready to roll as well. There is, and there's exactly 20 minutes, Carson.